All right, First Timothy chapter number 1. We'll begin reading in verse number 18. The Bible says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, in these verses... First off, in verse number 18, we see the charge that the Apostle Paul gives to Timothy. Now, in the verse 17 verses, we find the greeting that he sends to Timothy. And then, Paul just gets to bragging on Jesus a little bit and everything that Jesus has done for Paul. And how Paul didn't deserve grace, and how nobody deserves grace, but that God in his graciousness gave it to us anyway. And then by the time verse number 18 rolls around, Paul's had his you know, fit of the can't help it. Right, he's, he's done the testifying and the praising. But then in verse number 18, he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good war, warfare. In other words, because God is so gracious, because God's shown us such mercy, because we understand how much we don't deserve the love of God and how great the love of God is, because we appreciate that blessed assurance that we just sang about, we should desire to war a good warfare for Christ. He's saying, in other words, what I'm getting ready to tell you, it's not, you know, in detail, but if you can do these things, you're going to war a good warfare. And then, of course, it wasn't the end of the letter. You've still got the rest of 1 Timothy and the rest of 2 Timothy on everything that the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy that he might war a good warfare. Okay, but in verse number 19, he gives us two things. Holding faith and a good conscience. They say, Timothy, you want to war good warfare? If you appreciate the love of God, the grace of God, you know, if you're humbled by the fact that the Almighty God of Heaven would choose one to save you and then two to use you, if you can hold your faith and a good conscience. Now we know, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And I, when I got a well, no, I think he told me this time. Most of the time it's a text message. But got a text, or pastor one day just walking by, hey, can you change the sign this week? Okay. And he says, put Thanksgiving on there and then do something, you know, put a new verse up. I didn't know what I was teaching on when I put that verse up, but the verse on the sign this week says, I live by the faith of the Son of God out of Galatians. Right? I don't live, nevertheless, Christ liveth in me. All right, well, what's holding the faith? Understanding, it's not me that's doing the living anymore, it's him. He put that new creature, made me into a new creature, put the seed of himself in my heart. He's the one that's living through me. I can't do that without faith in him. But then it also says, holding a good conscience. What well, does that mean? Well, are we not instructed that we should do all things as unto Christ? Are we not instructed to esteem others better than ourselves? Are we not instructed to... First, keep the great commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And then love thy neighbor as thyself. What's all of keeping a good conscience? Knowing that you can stand before God and say, I did what God told me to do. I followed the instructions of God. That when I kneel in prayer, of course, I'm going to have to repent. I'm still in a sinly flesh. Right? We're tempted. We fail. We do sin. But when it comes to having a good conscience, when I realized I sinned, or in the moment that I was about to sin, I asked God to help me and asked Him to take the temptation away, help me get through the temptation. That as soon as I was made aware of the sin, I got it made right so that I wasn't out of fellowship with God longer than was necessary. Right? A good conscience. Did I take care of everything as soon as I could, as well as I could have, and did I do it for the honor and glory of God? That's a good conscience. Now, are we all going to stand before God and God will say, you didn't do anything wrong? No. But he knew that we were imperfect when he saved us. That's why he robed us in Christ's righteousness, because all my righteousness is filthy rags. That's why Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, because he knew I couldn't pull the load on my own. That's why he said he would be the friend that sticketh closer than a brother, because there are some days that our family wants to stone us, but Christ said he'd never stone us. 
Right? He did say that we would be hated because of his namesake, that we'd be persecuted because they persecuted him. But he said, I know you can't handle it on your own. That's why I'm here with you. He knew that we wouldn't be able to discern between right and wrong on our own. That's why the Holy Ghost indwells us. That's why we have the Word to tell us. Because we can't. But what Paul's telling Timothy, again in verse 17, or 18, he said, according to the prophecies which went before on thee. What's that prophet? Well, in the New Testament, prophesying is preaching. And when he says that preaching that went before on in other words, Timothy, you've heard everything that I preached. That's why he called son Timothy. He was a son in the faith. He said, you've heard the gospel. You've heard the doctrine that God's given to me that I've preached to all these churches. You've studied the rest of Paul's writings. When Paul couldn't be there, he would send Timothy sometimes as the evangelist. Now, Timothy was also a pastor, but every now and then, Paul would write a letter and say, Timothy, they need you down here. They need you over there. I've already got Titus over here. Can you go preach to him down there, be an encouragement to him? He had heard enough preaching not only to get saved, not only to surrender to the call to preach, he had heard enough preaching to know what was right. That's why the Apostle Paul said, in order for that preaching to be any good, you've got to hold faith and you've got to have a good conscience. Because how can Timothy get up and pastor if he knows that all throughout the week he's lived like the world? That the message that the Apostle Paul preached to him, he doesn't want to preach it to others because he's afraid to. Right? Well, I know what you're sitting there and thinking. I'm not a preacher. I'm not involved in the ministry. Well, yes, you are. You may just not realize it. All the preaching that you do is for you to go and be a written epistle known, of read of, known and read of all men. That you go out into the world to maybe be the only Bible that they ever read, but certainly to be a light, certainly to be the salt of the earth. And why is the Apostle Paul so intent on Timothy? Why was God so intent on us having this portion of Scripture to read? Because of verse number 20. Hymenaeus and Alexander. They say they didn't hold the faith. They didn't keep a clean conscience, a good conscience. They were not able to say that they did everything as they heard preached by the Apostle Paul, everything that they were instructed to do by the Holy Ghost. They didn't follow it. And the Apostle Paul said that he turned them over to Satan. Well, what's that mean? Well, we can go over to 1 Corinthians 5, 5. And in there you'll see that God turned some over to the destruction of the flesh so that the soul might be saved. That they had grieved their own soul so much that God decided it was better for them to be off of the earth so that the soul that he saved wouldn't be grieved by their actions any longer. That they wouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit that was trying to use them to do something for God and instead it would become a stumbling block instead of a stepping stone for those around them. People were dying and going to hell over these two men's lives instead of helping them understand that they need to get to Christ. Being the tool, being the one that may have planted, may have watered, but they weren't living a life that God could give the increase off of it. In fact, they were doing contrary to what the will of God was for them to do. Now there's a space of grace. God is long-suffering. God is loving. He's caring. He's gracious. But there comes a time that God says, you're not going to be a hindrance to the cause of Christ anymore but what happened to Hymenaeus Alexander well in verse number 19 it says which some having put away talking about faith and good conscience concerning faith have made shipwreck what does that mean they were out and they were sailing for a while but they put away the navigational charts they got rid of the compass, which is listening to the Holy Spirit. And then one day they decided to leave the helm of the ship. And then they found themselves crashed on a bunch of rocks. Anybody remember them? I don't, I don't know what year this was. I want to say it was the late 2000s, early 10s, somewhere in there. Some big cruise line sailing in the Mediterranean. The captain had a bunch of attractive ladies up in the helm and he wanted to impress them so he got real close to the shoreline of this island and everybody knows you don't get close to this island there's a whole bunch of rocks and then sirens started going off inside of the helm and they were like hey rocks 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 but he kept getting closer and then this guy tipped over 
and sank a giant cruise ship because he wanted to impress the people. What did he do? He threw common sense out the window. He threw all the instruments out the window. And then as everything's telling him, hey, there's rocks down there, he thought, nah, I can handle the rocks. Alexander and Hymenaeus thought, I can handle those rocks. I can live the way I want to and still sail for Christ. Well, long before they were get, turned over to Satan, they were made shipwrecked. Now, thankfully, doesn't matter how bad you mess your ship up, God can repair it if you repent of it. Amen. He can unbeat you. He can plug the holes. He can get you back sailing. Because we do serve a God of forgiveness. But in order to be forgiven, we must first repent. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. An if and then statement. God cannot forgive what we are not repentant of. I didn't say sorry of, I said repentant of. That means we turn from it. Right? I'm sorry of a whole lot of things that happen to other people. I can't change it for them. The Apostle Paul said that he himself would become accursed for the nation of Israel. If, in other words, if he could go to hell so that everybody that was ever one of God's chosen people would go to heaven, he said he'd do it. But he says, I'm sorry about the, the way that their life is, that they disobeyed God, that Adam sinned. He's saying, I'm sorry that all that happened, but I can't change it because he can't repent for them. And because people are unrepentant, Keep in mind, Alexander and Hymenaeus knew God. They were saved. But why did the Apostle Paul say that they were turned over to Satan? Because the end of verse number 20, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, we don't know that when the Apostle Paul said that he turned them over to Satan, this could be an allusion to what Christ told Peter, that Satan had desired to have him, that he may sift him as wheat. How can you learn to do something if... You're in the ground. I, I don't know. I wasn't there. But Timothy knew what the Apostle Paul was talking about here. Whatever the context was. But he's saying, they've been delivered unto Satan so that either through the sifter they learn not to blaspheme or that others around these two may learn not to blaspheme against God if God puts them in the ground very serious business if he's turned over to Satan if Hymenaeus was delivered under the enemy so that either he would learn or that others would learn not to blaspheme pretty serious stuff so with the Lord's help this morning we're going to teach on blasphemous Christians blasphemous Christians now a lot of times people get the terms blasphemy and heresy mixed up very similar sometimes one thing can be both but they are different okay heresy or heretical teachings are things that contradict the doctrine of the bible you are teaching a false doctrine a false doctrine makes someone twofold a child of hell but you cannot in theory be heretical on your own you can believe something wrong but if you keep attending a church that teaches the truth God's going to straighten you out eventually right. right you cannot be you can believe wrong all you want but if you keep hanging around the things of God God's going to straighten you out I mean we've had people that were members of other churches that when they come here they didn't realize right well what's that that's God doing the work in you you had the faith you trusted you believed on Jesus Christ that thou should be saved but some of the things afterwards I mean we've had situations where people come from a different denomination and then at first didn't understand why they had to be baptized into the church because the other denomination didn't do it right you weren't baptized in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost not for salvation right? not as a work but as obedience unto Christ and to become a member of the church if a congregation that isn't a part of the church of God not the denomination of the church not a part of Christ's church let's call it that way if they're not in the church that Christ started you can't be baptized into the church by that congregation right the congregation has to know Christ as Savior in order for you to join it right I can get you wet all day long it's not going to mean that you were baptized into a church 
Right? I could baptize you into every denomination in the world. Doesn't mean it's going to stick. Right? Especially in the eyes of God, because it was one of the two ordinances that God gave to the church. So how can somebody that isn't the church do one of the things that God enabled the church to do? That's rabbit number one that we've chased today. But all that being said, heresy is teaching different than what God says. What God pinned down and what he preserved into the infallible word of God so that man would not know what man said God said, but have the very words of God that God gave unto man so that man would know what God said. It's not an interpretation. It is delivered from heaven to you. Right? But then, what is blasphemy? Well, blasphemy isn't necessarily going out and propagating a false religion or a false doctrine. I mean, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, it is the act of impious behavior towards God. Well, what's, what's piety towards God? You fear God. You reverence God. You understand He is Lord and you are not. You know what a lot of Christians don't have today? Piety towards God. Fear towards God. Submission towards God. Humility in the house of God. Humility towards God in their daily life. They may get real small when they come to these doors. Well, that's because they're either under conviction or they're ashamed of the fact that they haven't done anything since the last time they were here. But as soon as they walk out the doors, or sometimes as soon as the amen said, all of a sudden their ego gets a little bit bigger. They start fellowshipping and now they think that they're the most important thing in the room. What are those people? They're not pious towards God. It's all about them. And they've been white knuckling it through the church service just so that they could hang out with their friends afterwards. I mean, you could say you're crazy. Well, it's the truth. I mean, I dare say many of us have been in that situation before. We put on the front when we come in. Well, what is it? It's about what I feel. It's about how I feel. It's what I think of myself. It's got nothing to do with God. Right? I'll give you an example of blasphemy. Now, what did the Pharisees say of Christ? When Christ said that, you know, your sins be forgiven you. They said, hey, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus said, yeah, I know that. And bingo. <laughs> they didn't understand that he was God. When he said that he and his father were one, he meant it. They hadn't put that together yet. And some of them never put it together. But the blasphemy was saying that somebody else other than God could forgive sins. We weren't teaching that God couldn't forgive sins. Right? Jesus didn't say that, you know, Satan could forgive sin. Right? They tried to get him on that one too when he cast devils out of people. Well, he must be of the devil because he's casting out the devil's servants. Well, how can the devil cast out himself was the answer. Right? Only something stronger than the devil can cast out the devil. Well, what's that? God. Right? Blasphemy is attributing a non-godly behavior to God. It is showing undue respect and reverence towards God. And a lot of time, a blasphemous heart turns into a heretical heart because they didn't fear God and because they said things against God that in God's long-suffering, He may not have you know, opened up the earth and swallowed them up. But as they get further and further away from God, they get enough rope to hang themselves with, and then they become heretics. Long before you ever start believing something that's contrary, or teaching something that's contrary to the Word of God, in your heart, you haven't been right as far as your attitude, your demeanor, and your view of God. Right? You don't start believing a false Bible until you get cold on the delivered Word of God, the preserved Word of God. You don't start believing false doctrines until you've forgotten what the real doctrine was. Or you've lost your conviction of why the real doctrine is the way it was. Where does that start? With a flippant attitude towards God. What's that? Blasphemy. They may, and by they I mean Hymenaeus and Alexander, may have taught the right doctrine. But their lifestyle said that they didn't believe that God was capable of doing everything that they were preaching. 
Right? Certainly. Well, one, it's one of the Ten Commandments. We know it's a sin. To take the name of the Lord in vain. But any time that someone invokes the name of God, Christ, Holy Spirit, in an irreverent way, it's blasphemous. Why? Because one, God had nothing to do with probably what you're talking about. It's just by His grace that it didn't wipe us off the face of the earth, even if we are saved, for being in that situation in the first place. Amen. But His name is so holy that the Hebrews removed all the vowels from it because they didn't want to write the very name of God because in their eyes they were too sinful to write the name Jehovah. Amen. That's where the term Yahweh comes from because in Hebrew, that's Jehovah pronounced in Hebrew without the vowels. They didn't even think that it was, you know, even though God told them what his name was, they said, we're not even worthy to say Jehovah. And in the flesh, I'm not worthy to say the name Jehovah, but he's my heavenly father. I've received the adoption of sonship. Because his son bought and purchased me with his own blood, I can call him and cry out, Abba, Father. But see, those that even, they may not say Jehovah, they mean God, Christ. Right? They may even use the phrase Lord. Oh, Lord. Better be careful. Better be careful when it comes to what does the Bible say that we do not swear by anything in the earth, above the earth, under the earth? Why? Because everything above it, that's God's throne. That's way above us. Why under the earth? Because, well, there's a couple of things down there. Hell's in the center of the earth. Don't want to swear by anything down there. And in the dead, we don't want to swear by them either. Right? But why on the earth? Because God created everything on the earth. Everything we see is by the power of God. Right? To swear by it, whether positively or negatively, is to blaspheme against God. Right? Well, those are a few examples. But well, let's get into blasphemous Christians. What are blasphemous Christians? Well, there's blasphemy in word. And we've kind of gotten onto that in our examples. But what is blaspheming in word? Well, God hates me. No. That's blasphemy. And everybody that just heard you say that now has an improper understanding of who God is because you've attributed a trait to God that isn't true. Does God hate sin? Yes. Is God angry with the wicked every day? Yes. But does he love their soul? Yes. When someone says, well, why would God send them to hell? Wrong. There's one sin that sends people to hell, the sin of unbelief. It was God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, why did God let them die? Wrong. Sin caused man to die. It was God's will that man would live in paradise forever with him in the Garden of Eden. And now it's his will that instead of the Garden, we get to live in heaven. But they didn't receive him. But why would God not allow somebody in that country to hear the gospel? Well, does not the Bible say that sin is carried out into the third and fourth generation? Sometimes even longer. And if you study it out, every country today where it's illegal to preach and teach the name of Jesus Christ, they were offered the opportunity at some point in history, and the leader said no. And as a result, God has honored or God has punished that decision. Jesus came into his own, and his own received him not. Who to go to? The lame, the halt, the maim, the Gentiles, those that didn't have a claim to him. If you reject him, there's no guarantee that he'll ever come back. That's why today is the day of salvation. We don't know what's going to come tomorrow. That's why today is the day that the Lord has made in meaning. All I can do is affect today. Tomorrow's gone, and tomorrow's a mystery. I don't know what God has on the morrow or what God in his omniscience knows is going to happen tomorrow. He may know I'm not going to have the time to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it today. But blasphemy is saying something of God that is not true. Are we building a religion off of it? No. But everybody that hears us say it, now if they believe us, has a wrong idea or interpretation of God. Blasphemy used to be punishable by death. 
Because such a severe punishment shows everyone around you, that guy was so wrong that we're not going to suffer him to be around us. We don't want God's wrath because we harbored somebody who spoke ill of God. Who said something of God that wasn't true. But see, I can say those things, but there's also blasphemy in deed. Not just in word. A lot of Christians say the right things, but the proof's in the pudding. They may say they have faith in God, that they believe God's going to take care of them, but throughout the rest of the week, or maybe throughout the next month after they say that, their life, they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off. They're wringing their hands. They're wailing. Always crying. They don't know what to do. Well, where's your faith? Your word said that God's great and he's able to do everything that he promised to do unto me, so I'm going to believe in him. But your life says God's not powerful enough to do what I thought he was going to do. Now, most of the time, that's not true. We wanted God to do something that wasn't the will of God. That's usually what it boils down to. And then we're fretting, wondering how we're going to get what we want since God isn't going to give it to us. But instead of understanding, I don't need that or else God would give it to me, and I already have what I need to do what God wants me to do, people start wringing their hands. They get all upset. Maybe it's because spiritually they're shallow. They haven't been in fellowship with God. They don't have a strong relationship and fellowship with God. And so when they went into the trial or into the test that God was trying to prepare them for, they weren't ready. That's not God's fault. That's my fault. Right, but the blasphemy indeed is to say, yeah, God's great. God's all-knowing. God's all-powerful. God's everywhere at once. He's going to meet every need of my life. But then when something happens and we go to something besides God, our testimony to the world is a blasphemous. God's good enough for you when things are easy, but when things get hard, you've got to go look for something else. Got to go see the banker. Got to go see some family members. Got to leave the church family because I'm going to go try and find some of those old friends that I know that they might know how to sort things out in the world. What is that? That's a blasphemous life before God. Your very actions, your deeds say, God isn't all that I thought he was. You may not be saying that God's not all-powerful, that he's not all-knowing, that he's not omniscient. You might not be saying that God didn't do one of the things that he promised to do for me. Because if I get in here, I find it's impossible for God to lie. If I get in here, he renews the vows and the promises that he made to his people every day. Every day, before you wake up, God has already re-promised all the promises of the Bible specifically to you. But when I run around fretting, when all of my conversation is, well, I don't know where it's going to come from. Well, I don't know how this is going to be resolved. All that you're saying is, God isn't all that I said he was. Or, I bought into it hook, line, and sinker, but it wasn't the fishing pole that I thought I was attached to. What's that tell the world? God isn't worth going to. God isn't capable of doing for you what I said he did for me. What is that? That tarnishes the name of Christ, the name of God. That is blasphemy. You want to know why sinners don't rush to the house of God anymore? Because too many people have lived a blasphemous life in the world, even though they may have said the right thing, may have dressed the right way, may have socially lived the right life, but when it came down to where the rubber met the road, their life said, God can't help you like I said he could. And that's blasphemous. Because nobody ever came to Jesus that he turned away. Everyone that came to Jesus sincerely always left different than the way that they came. Whatever they desired, if they came with faith, he rewarded it. Why do you think Paul told Timothy, hold on to that faith and that good conscience? Because when your faith goes, then all of your expectations all of your dependency upon God, he cannot reward it because you have removed the very thing that he expects from us. 
Cars don't run without keys. Christian lives don't work without faith. And because today everything is so immediate, everything is hands-on, it's on demand, you don't even need to buy cable TV anymore. You can just download the app. But YouTube now has sports and everything on YouTube TV. What's that? I don't know, but you can buy it. You don't have to watch all the channels you don't want. You can just watch the ones you want. Why are people so interested in that? Because they got tired of clicking through the channels. And they, did rid, they got rid of that a long time ago. Now there's like TV guides on the screen. You just scroll up and down and pick what channel you want. You don't even need to click. But what's that? Instant gratification. You know what faith involves? Waiting on God. You know what faith involves? Enduring hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, waiting on God to do what we cannot do. Well, I want God to do what I can't do right now. Faith says God's timing is more important than mine. Faith says, yeah, it's hard right now, but I know he's going to deliver. Unfaithfulness in someone who doesn't keep a good conscience goes and searches for every answer first and then comes to God as a last resort. That's blasphemy. Is he not your heavenly father? Did he not promise to meet your needs? I mean, I could... The Bible tells us, if we sat down and prayed for all the things that we needed, it's, God knows what we have need of. He promised to take care of it. We don't need to tell him he's omniscient. But if I sat down and prayed every day for the things I need, not the things I want, not the things that God blessed me with, as you know, the icing on top of the already very, very sweet cake. But the needs. You know how much time a day I'd be telling God the things that He already knows? You know how much time I'd be wasting that I could be interceding for others, that I could be lifting up others in supplication, that I could be praising and thanking God? Because I really want to do that because God inhabits the praise of His people. But those that grieve the Holy Ghost, that's, that's a sin. And if you grieve Him when He's dealing with you about your salvation, there's no repentance for that sin. You rejected God. But grieve not, quench not. That's not blasphemous. But if you grieve Him and quench Him long enough, you're going to start doing things that are blasphemous and He won't deal with you about it because you've already been so far away from Him and rejected Him so many times that now you have to reap what you've sown. You told God to leave you alone, and he did. Very serious business. How many times do you think the Apostle Paul and the Holy Ghost tried to tell Alexander, Alexander and Hymenaeus, hey, if you keep going down that road, you're going to run into Satan. Don't go, hey, I'm not going to judge you. Judgment has been committed unto Christ. I just want to get you back. I want to restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, lest I likewise be tempted. I want to help you because I was low once and somebody helped me. And when I was at my lowest, Jesus showed up and helped me far more than anybody else could. So I know he could take care of what you're doing right now. But how many times did somebody say, hey, come on back? Hey, you know that that sounds really true. You remember in the Psalms when he said this? Why don't... When has God ever let you down before, Alexander? Name one time, Hymenaeus, that God didn't fulfill a promise that he made to you. But they just kept going and going until they ran into Satan. And all the roadblocks that God had put in the way to keep them from getting there, they ran right through. But now, I will make a caveat here. Why does the Apostle Paul know that blasphemy is so dangerous? Why did he take it so seriously that he said, he turned Alexander, Alexander and Hymenaeus over to Satan? Because of verse number 13. This is talking about his testimony. He's saying, before I got saved, verse number 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, 
but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He's saying, because I was a blasphemer, because I believed God was different than God actually is, he says, I was a persecutor and injurious. Paul's saying, I know what blasphemy can do when it comes to people. He says, I lived a blasphemous life before God. He had papers that were signed by somebody that in this world had authority that said those Christians down there that believed, they're wrong. They thought that Christ was a heretic and that his followers were heretics. Paul said, on paper everything was right, but one day I ran into God. He was on that road to Damascus. In fact, he got such a good glimpse, he went blind for a little bit. But he's saying heresy is injurious. Not only to believers, but to unbelievers. Blasphemy causes a lot of persecution. Because those that aren't right with God don't like those that are right with God. Because they see everything they could have but chose not to have because they wanted what they have in their hands right now. It'll cause infighting and divisions. But doesn't the Bible tell us to keep the hedge, to make up the hedge, staying in the gap? To keep the little foxes out because they're the ones that spoil the vines? Amen. That we ought not break the hedge because those are the ones that the serpent biteth? That's what the Apostle Paul saying. He said there's a lot of vipers out there that are blasphemous. They want to persecute. They want to do injury. And he says the only reason that he found forgiveness for those things was because he had been lied to. He was twofold the child of hell. Because somebody taught him incorrectly and he believed it. But then when he was confronted with the truth, he said, I'm junking all that. What do you want me to do, God? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to see? And who do you want me to tell about you? He said, he did it ignorantly. But how many Christians, they may not knowingly or consciously do it, but every day they're out there and they know better, but they live different. Some of them are so far away from God that they do, and it never even dawns on them what God would want them to do. Or dawns on them to stop and say, Lord, I don't know what to do, and in the flesh I'm panicking, so Lord, guide me. If you want me to wait, I'll wait. If you want me to go, just tell me which way to go. What's that? It's casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. There are times you're going to not know what to do. Or in the flesh, you're just going to have that knee-jerk reaction. That, well, if X happened, we're supposed to do Y. Well, who told you that? Did God tell you that? Or did the world tell you that? Because the world tells you a bill comes up, you go to the bank man. Get a loan. God tells you, well... He may send a fish your way that you get out of the river and there's going to be a whole bunch of money in there to pay the taxes. You say, that can't happen. Talk to some of the people around here. Talk to some of the people in this room about when they waited what God did. Look back in your life and, so, and see how many times when you did what God said, how he openly and publicly rewarded your faith. Because those things that are done in secret, he rewards openly. If you have private, intimate, personal faith, nobody may ever know what you pray. Nobody may ever know what's going on in your life, but God will be able to use it for His honor and His glory because you didn't blaspheme. You didn't throw your hands up in the air and say, well, I, was, I tried to live for God and then this bad thing still happened to me. Look at all the bad things that happened to Jesus. You telling me that you're persecuted more than he was, that you're hated more than he was, that you've got more people trying to take your life than he did? You're trying to tell me that you're fighting more of the imps of hell than he did on the cross of Calvary? You're telling me that you've got more on your plate than the one who by him and through him all things consist? And they'll say, well, no, that's not what I'm saying. But that was what they're saying, they just didn't realize it. And once confronted with it, they say, oh, well, I didn't realize I was saying all that. Why do you think God pinned down so much about how to walk with God? 
because it's very easy to do something just a little wrong. Well, I didn't realize it'd be perceived that way. Well, God did. That's why he instructed you or tried to lead you in the Holy Ghost not to say that. Because he understands how other people hear things. He understands how other people receive things. And what we perceive is just venting or letting off a little steam or what in a moment of heartbreak or in a moment of pain or in a moment of lack of understanding, just frustration, one thing that we say that's blasphemous can do a whole lot of harm out there. And you best believe if you give the devil the ammunition, he's going to use it to hurt those around you. Why was it so important? Because their words may have been right. Their deeds may have been right. But the way that they lived their life said, God isn't who I said God was. I know I told you he could take care of it. He can't. I know I told you that he loved you, but right now I think he hates me. Don't the scripture say, though he slay me, yet will I serve him? What's that mean? He can do whatever he wants to with me. He's God. I'm just a bunch of dirt that God put life into. But he bought me on the auction block and said, if I get the most honor and glory towards the name of Christ by him slaying me, I'm all for it. You know what that says? I've not only completely let go of the steering wheel, I've thrown the steering wheel out the window, and I'm driving on faith. And really, I'm in the back seat because he's the one driving. He's not the co-pilot. I'm not the co-pilot. I'm all the way in the back row next to the bathrooms, and every now and then I get to look up and see through the cockpit and see, wow, God's doing some great stuff up there. Just by faith, I'm believing that the plane's going to get to where it's going to get to, and I'm going to be okay. And when it's time to board up, he'll let me back on the plane. But when we try to take control, a whole lot of heresy. And we may not realize it. And I promise you that if we continue to live such a life, God will deal with us one way or the other. He'll either break us through conviction or he'll deliver us unto Satan. Whether to be destroyed or to be sifted, that's up to God. But blasphemous Christians do a whole lot of damage, a whole lot of injury. And God will not suffer his church to suffer damage and injury and those lost souls that should be one to Christ he's liable to remove the stumbling blocks that are in the way do you struggle to find good bible based resources to supplement your personal devotions if so head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on bookstore where we have a ton of resources and as always thanks for listening